This is a brand new episode of MMA Past, Present, and Future. We have an absolute loaded lineup. Let me give it to you real quick. Uh, I, of course, am Keith Schillen. We have in the third segment, in the present, I'm sorry, in the future segment, we have Jacob Silva, who fights on CF, CFFC this weekend. On the second segment, in the present, we have Casey Kenny, who takes on Dominic Cruz in a pivotal uh, matchup. But first, we have a veteran of the UFC, of Bellator, of Pride, and he was the Strike Force lightweight champion. He, of course, as you already see, is Bellator color commentary, Josh Thompson. Josh, how you doing, my man? Good, man. Thanks for having me on, brother. Oh, yeah, for sure. Thanks for taking the time. So, this is probably a question you get all the time. Now, you've had, a, obviously, a very decorated career, some extremely uh, high points. I mean, I think of a, one of the best rivalries with, with Gilbert Melendez, a uh, knockout of Nate Diaz, all these different things. If you could pick one moment, like what's the one moment that you know, you, you're going to tell your grandchildren about? Um, you know, there's not, I can't say there's one moment like, that I would tell my grandkids about. I would really tell them to watch all three of the Gill fights. Yeah, you know, and fights. just see and, and to, for them as they got older, for to see the progressions of the first fight, me being so dominant. The second fight, to me, I feel like him being a, a little bit more dominant. Sure. And then in the third fight, it being one of those toss-up fights, where I mean, you know, a, a lot of people thought I won, and of course I thought I won, yeah. and the judges didn't see it that sure. way. But it is. But what it did was it left people wanting more. Yeah, that's right. You know what I mean? In the in the what ifs, everyone's always thought like, what what have we fought again? And what is? Sure. And it kind of left it left it knowing just that we were so good, and we were actually good for each other. Yeah. You know, I would I'd probably recommend you know grandchildren or kids or whatever to to view that. But if there was one moment in my career that um, to me defined me as a person, and I could say that it probably was it towards the beginning of my career for sure. There was another moment towards the end that let me know that I was still that person was in the Hermes Franca fight. I was yeah. dominating the fight the first two rounds. I got clipped at the very beginning of the third, and he beat the crap out of me for a good two and a half minutes, almost three minutes probably. I survived. Um, I finished the third round stronger than he did because he had gassed himself out. But that wasn't the point to me. The point to me was I wanted to know if I was a real fighter. I wanted sure. to know if I was a guy that was – I got a lot of street fights. I got a lot of fights at nightclubs and bars and things like that. You know, and then in, in school, I got a lot of fights in school. I wanted to know if I was a bully or if I was somebody that, like, would cower when things got rough. And I, so sure. I kept fighting. It, it was more of a mental thing for me. It was, I was trying to prove to myself, are you really tough? Or are you just tough when other people are not as tough as you? Yeah. yeah. It was a lot of proving, my, proving it to myself. and. I will. I'll re I revisited it again during the Tony Ferguson fight. Oh, there was yeah. never a moment in that fight where I wanted to quit, and so I. It just in my mind. I, it, that was the Hermes Franca fight. Was a. It was a let me know that I was always. I was. I wasn't a quitter, and 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 uh, and then in the in the in the Tony Ferguson fight, it let me know that I still wasn't a quitter. Sure. I still had had the heart in me. I just didn't have. I didn't have. I, I've gotten older. You know, I was thirty. Sure. 30 seven years old I think when I fought Tony and it just wasn't it, you just I could tell I was slower I wasn't seeing things coming as fast it was a lot of things you know and, yeah. and just but the, the the heart was still there and I always look at guys like I look at guys like Evander Holyfield the heart was still there but the abilities weren't and sure. I always told myself I wouldn't be that guy so if there was something out of my mind that in the, <clears throat> that stood out to me for myself would be those two fights. Sure. And the realization of that, you know, it's getting close to being done in time. And then, but then the moments I would brag about to my grandchildren or my kids or whatever it is, and I would say to watch all three of the Gill fights. No, incredible. I, my, whole, my whole career was shaped because him and I had a rivalry. We sure. trained together to each other, but then we also fought three times. We spent, you know, um, we, we spent 75 minutes in the cage. You know, and 15 rounds. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. They were all hard-fought rounds, and that was the one thing that, you know, I mean, every minute of every of every round was fought hard by both of us, and so um, that that let me know that like who I was as a, as a fighter. Yeah. So the so the Tony Ferguson fight, it, it was a little bit of a patch in you know, the torch. That was kind of his really like 
eye-opening performance where suddenly he really elevated himself to the high level. You mentioned you didn't, when you started to slow down a little bit, you mentioned your age. You also, at the end of your career, you dealt with a lot of injuries. Do you think, you feel like that did a lot to it too? Well, I dealt with a lot of injuries throughout my whole career. You got to remember okay. after, I beat, after I beat Gil the first time, um, I had broke my ankle. I had fought Matt, uh, Ash Bowman at the Playboy Mansion. And, and then like shortly after that, I was getting ready to fight Gil again. Uh, okay. Because we had just got accepted to go on to Showtime during the whole Strike Force Showtime Elite XE merger. Sure. And when that happened, <clears throat> um, I was I, I had got I had actually broke my ankle training with a guy named Billy Evangelista. He oh yeah. yeah. Jumped, tried to jump on my back and he missed and landed on the back of my ankle and snapped my ankle. I, I had to have a plate put in with nine screws and I, you know I still got the hardware in there now. But it yeah. just changed it changed a lot of how I fought. My, my game changed after that. I was a big kicker with the front leg, and That's I couldn't right. kick anymore with that. I, throughout that, after I had the surgery there, I started trying to come back around seven, six months later, and then I rebroke it above the plate. And then I tried, I waited another 10 weeks, tried to come back again, rebroke it again. So I broke it almost three, I think I, I, think I broke it three more times above the plate after I'd had the surgery, each time trying to come back to fight Gil. And in the process, Gil was getting more fights because he was always scheduled to fight me. And then when I fell off, he fought somebody else. So he ended up getting his game plan back on track and figuring out and building his confidence, fighting lesser guys, but building his confidence. And so when we fought the second time, he was a completely different fighter than I fought the first time. And so much time had lapsed, you know, two years, almost a, almost two years had lapsed by the time we had fought the second time. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, and that was me defending the title against him. And yeah. so it was, it, I was plagued with injuries throughout. If, if people don't recall, and, and Sean Shelby can, can, can confirm this, I'm, I think I still have the record for the fighter who signed the contract to fight in the UFC. And I didn't fight for almost two years after. Yeah, yeah. You know, because of injuries, because, uh, I mean, I got injured several times. Um, I'd gotten some trouble as well. And, you know, had to go to jail for a little while and things like that. And, and, uh, you know, like it was, it was a, a lot, a lot of little things, but I mean, I think I signed with him. I think I signed with the UFC early 2001. I didn't fight for them until the end of 2002. Yeah. So, that, your first stint in the UFC. Yeah. My first stint in the UFC. Yeah. So let's talk about that for a second. I'm glad you brought up the first stint because it's a much different game now. It was a lot more popular now, but what always stands out to me, which I always find funny when I talk about the lightweight division it's, it's, you know, in the UFC, that's like the glamour division. That's the division Connor was in, in Habib. And then I think about Bellator, in my opinion, and I, I, you probably agree with me, or, or a lot of people agree with me, featherweight's the, your best division. That's the, the glamour division right now. But that wasn't always the case. Like the smaller guys were looked at, like shunned upon. And there was a time where the, the lightweight division, the UFC actually faded away. They actually shut it down. And you guys had a good division. I mean, it was you. You mentioned Hermes Franca. Eve Edwards, BJ Penn, Dean Thomas, Matt, I'm just spitball, Matt Sarah, yeah. uh, who am I forgetting? Uh, anyways, these are good, good fighters. What did the UFC do wrong to not see the potential of that division, which, you know, 10 years later is as, was as popular as it possibly could be? Well, you got to remember that the, the promotion was built originally back in when it first started in what, 90, 92, 93? 93, 93, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, 93, when the UFC had first started, it was built around big guys. Sure. And the ones that weren't big, and, like, that's what people tuned in to watch. And then it went from them to Frank Shamrock, Tito Ortiz, Mark Coleman. It was that generation of guys, Mark Kerr. They didn't want to see little guys fight. They want to see big guys fight in a cage. And so yeah. when guys like Jens Pulver, John Lewis, myself, yeah. uh, you know, BJ Penn, like, I think BJ Penn is the biggest reason why the, the lightweight division was ignited. But it, it faded out. And, and, and the, when you said it went away, it went away for a uh, little over two, I think three yeah. years, or like three or four years. Yeah. And I, Edwards and I were the last actual lightweight fight there was until they brought them back. And, and think about, like, I don't want to bring up a bad topic, but think about how spectacular that fight was. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the yeah. greatest fights ever. Yeah, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to bring, I was not going to bring that one up, but yeah. No, no, it, it, it's okay. It's okay. Like, I, look, I mean, Eves and I are really good friends. Even after that fight, I went out there and he was fighting a guy in Japan who was a kind of a taller, longer, lankier guy. And uh, I went out there and flew out there to help him train. 
So yeah. I, we're, we're good friends. We actually did one of his, we just did his podcast recently. It was the very first episode he did where we, we talked over the fight yeah. and about how we were thinking and what happened. And no, there's no ill will at all. I mean, like I said, in 10, in 10 20 years, no one's going to give a crap about those fights anyways. They're just going to yeah. be talking about the newest and the newest breed and da 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 da. Yeah. So I don't, I don't let things like that get to me at all. Um, I got nothing but respect for each. The sport sure. itself um, at that time, when you talk about me, Hermes Franca, Eves Edwards, you have to remember that the generation that was right before us, I felt was a better generation. And, and, really? and what a, it, had, it had bigger names. It had Matt Sarah. It had BJ Penn. Okay. It had Dick Thomas. It had more. And don't get me wrong. Hell, I no. Yeah, Carl Uno, you know, I mean, I had these guys that they, they had big names in the sport. With myself and Eves, we're pretty much the only two guys during the generation that him and I should have been fighting for the title outside of Hermes. But it was mainly Eves and I. And that was yeah. it. The rest of the guys in that division, remember, BJ went to 170 and fought Matt Hughes That's on the right. same card that fought Hermes Franca and beat Hermes Franca. Yeah. You know, um, Kelly, Matt, Kelly no. used to always bounce around from Japan, and there he was always he was never settled in the UFC. He was always bouncing yeah, around. He never settled in. And then Matt Sarah fought GSP for the title and went on that show. Remember on the Ultimate Fighter? Yeah. yeah. He kind of he went up to one seventy, got tired of making the cut to fifty five. Din Thomas kind of he retired just, for a little while. He retired. retired. Like it, the, the division and Jens Polward went away. You know, after the uh, the BJ Penn first fight. Yeah. It was. It was a little bit kind of like, you know, the, the, the guys that were around were not really we, – we lost the kind of the star power. So I understood why they did it, um, why they got rid of the division. And the other thing, too, is they were hemorrhaging money. Let's not, let's not forget that. Sure, you that's know? true. Um, and they were thinking to themselves, look, there's not a guy on the roster at 155. I mean, I know that Dana had talked to me about me being the guy and this and that. And then after losing to Eves the way I did, I mean, I, there was just no way. And I don't know if he was saying the same thing to Eves, but it was like, hey, man, we, you know, we could definitely build around you. We do this and we do that. But it never came to fruition. And I think coming off of a loss like that, I mean, you would have thought they would have built around Eves. But mm -hmm. I think it just came down to the fact that they just – they didn't have they, – they, I think if BJ Penn kept doing what he was doing until he had fought Jens, just starching guys like, oh, like yeah. he did so, like he did Dean Thomas. Like he was just starching guys. I mean, he that's was right. – Ashing guys, just getting through them. Yeah, I mean that's something you can build around a small guy that can just knock dudes out and then just mm -hmm. submit the shit out of you, control you, and jack you up on the ground. Like, like if if he hadn't have lost to Jens, I think they could have kept that thing going. Sure. He he kind of faded away and like he just wasn't in the same. And after the fifty fives, it wasn't the same. Remember they did the tournament, and it ended in a draw. There was a draw, and it was just it was a total shit show yeah. at the time. Yeah, you know, it was, couldn't get the UFC was plagued with bad luck at that time. Sure, Remember the champion the, left, Jens left with the belt, and then they did the tournament. The tournament you know, was a disaster. Yeah, and they remember. Do you remember though? Also, they did it. They did a three. That was the very first time they ever did three title fights in one night. Yeah, they, it they all went to a decision. All went to a decision. They were all super boring. No knockouts. It was just. It was. It was like, oh my gosh, man, I'm, I'm paying for this. What is this? And yeah. you know. And, don't remember that they were having to pay for the pay-per-views that right. they didn't they, they weren't getting paid by pay-per-view they were paying for the pay-per-views yeah, yeah so they were hemorrhaging money and, and the lightweight division went away for a while when it came back it came back strong you know because of the ultimate fighter and the guys that were on there and the 170 185 remember the whole, first ultimate fighter was 185 and 205 yeah you know it wasn't 170 no. and 185 even though a lot of those fighters that were fighting that weight then dropped <laughs> Down to 75. Yeah. Kenny, Kenny Florian went all the way down to 145 at one point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. obviously, the way we're, we're talking, we both, I could just tell you, I could just tell from your reaction, you love talking about the history. Obviously, this is the whole I reason why I, why I did this show is to go down that memory lane. But I want to talk about what you're doing because you're doing some amazing things right now. You're obviously extremely active in the sport. You're a color commentator for Bellator. What was the biggest transition going from the fighter to the commentator? <clears throat> Uh, that for me, there was no transition. Like, um, in terms of, you just have to remember, and I don't want to give out too much of my information because I don't want someone to steal my job. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it just comes down to what I've noticed over the years is that every fighter that has come in to be a commentator, they talk about me, me, me. Yeah. Well, it ain't about you. It's about how good that guy is in the cage or how yeah. good that female is in the cage. 
how good is how good is he or she you sure. know and and what it are they the next level of greatness that you could see building a promotion around or being a star and if you can settle in on that instead of talking about like the last time you fought somebody the last time you know you, you that you had got a knockout or you got a submission or if it was me i would have done this yeah, no yeah. One cares. like you, like no one cares that fighter is not you that fighter will never be you their style is not you and you have to remember that you know um you would and once you do that once you realize that it's not you then you need to and you need to shine light on them as if like they're and, and not to be i don't want to sound like i'm everyone's dad but like you have to shine on them like, like that's your son or your daughter that you're you're super proud of proud of yeah do this and they do that Look how good the look how good this fighter is. Look how great their conditioning is. They're the best at this. They're the best at that. I mean, without I mean, obviously without without making it too over the top, but letting sure. the world know that each one of those fighters that step in the cage, they bring something to the cage that's special. And if you can do that, if you can if you can talk to the public the way I'm talking to you right now and sell them something that that can be backed up with the actions inside the cage. I think you're going to have, you, you have the chance, your promotion has the chance of building a ton of stars. And, and, and like, we're, I know we're going to talk about Bellator in a little bit, but we've got that. We've sure. got that now. And, and, and Scott Coker said this just recently when they did the press release and they had the presser um, for, to, to announce the 205 yeah, yeah. title. I'm sorry, man, but when people compare the guys that we had in Strike Force and I came from there, Gil yeah. Rockhold and DC and, and a lot of those guys, I mean, Woodley and everyone, and Lawler, we have way more star potential stars and way That's better right. fighters than, they, than we had on that strike force roster. Yeah. Right now, we've got better fighters. And I know the games change and you know sure, and they, sure. but people evolve and uh, yeah. oh man, we've got we've got some very so talented guys. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad that you keep talking about like potential stars. I had a conversation, I'm not gonna say the person's name, but you obviously know who he is, uh, with one of the PR guys from from Bellator. We've you know, you develop a relationship by going to the shows and, and we were just talking and I say, you know, the one thing about MMA is a it's a star driven sport. Like people, you know, if you live in, like I, you can tell from my accent, I'm from new England, uh, you're going to support the new England teams. That's not how it is in MMA. You support a fighter. You want you have to connect with someone. You need a star. And we were talking about, and he said, oh, I think this guy could be a star. And this guy, and the guy said, I, the, the, to me, the face of, of Bellator needs to be. And I said, and this was about a year ago. AJ McKee. Am I right? Am I right? Is he the guy that, that, you know, I know it's obviously if he wins the tournament, that'll elevate him even higher. But to me, I see, this is the guy, this is, this is your star. Okay. So is he, is he our star? He could he be the star? Yes. Um, does he, I think out of everyone, he's got the most chance to beat Patricio, but uh, I'm sorry, but until you beat the guy, you're not it's the guy. Be, yeah. And, thing, and, and I'm going to, and, and not, I have nothing against Douglas Lima at all um but patricio pitbull is the best guy i i feel like he's probably one of the best guys in the world and for sure i think he's the best guy in his weight class in the world i think he's better than uh, volkanovsky now okay. stylistically matchups you know people want to talk about matchups sure sure you know they're like oh well max holloway well max holloway is not even the best in his own promotion yeah you know sure. so I, if you want to get into that i mean i know everyone's gonna be like oh you're acting like a homer no if we compare champion versus champion who is beaten who has beaten Max Holloway, then okay. But if you want to say if Max is the champion and Volkan and, and uh, Patricio is the champion, I would say, okay, you have a, a, that's a way harder fight for, for Patricio. But stylistically, Patricio to me is the better fighter. Yeah. So when you're talking champion versus champion, don't get me wrong. Now you throw in Brian Ortega, but I can sure, also sure. throw in AJ McKee. I'm sorry. No, absolutely. That's why we're talking about it. Physically is strong enough to handle both those guys. And I don't, people don't realize he's bigger than both those guys. Yeah, he's, he's a big guy. Athletic. He's way more athletic than both those guys. He's long. Um, he's he doesn't have the experience. He doesn't have as much experience as either one of those guys. But he's he's long. He's lengthy. He's got a lot of power. And creative. He's, he's very creative. The other thing as well that people are forgetting to uh, that they they don't see yet, and we're gonna see it probably in the Patricio or Emmanuel Sanchez whoever he fights next. We're gonna see it in that fight. In the last two fights, he's mature. Not in the last two, the last one. He's matured so much from sure. him, talking to him, being around him, the pressers, the fighter meetings around, around the uh, hotel during the time that he's going to fight or even pre-fight. The mindset is different. 
the reality yeah. is set in that he could make a million dollars. He's yeah. his fight person now have gotten bigger on top. So the million dollars on top of what he's making, mm -hmm. as well as if he beats Patricio, he's going to be considered probably the number one uh, featherweight in the world. I mean, ESPN had already had him as the number one uh, under 25 yeah. uh, fighter in the world or whatever. Like, that was like, know, and that was like two years ago. And yeah, he's gotten it's, better. It's, he's gotten better it's, since then. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah, better since then. So it was uh, almost a full year ago, I believe, is when they had that. Yeah, so uh, I want to move on to the light heavyweight in a second, but I still want to cover the featherweight because that's, like I said, it's my favorite division yeah. in Bellator. You mentioned a name, Emmanuel Sanchez. Is he being overlooked? Yes, he is. I mean, his first fight yeah. against Pitbull was – it was a very competitive fight. Like, yeah, it was, it was a competitive fight. But what I want people to remember is that Patricio is not the same fighter he was then either. And so sure. he's got a lot more confident. He's learned how to conserve his energy. He's learned how to not throw everything with power. He understands he has power. He doesn't need to load up. He uh, he's learned how to control his temper in the cage. He's okay. and that right there is what exhausts a lot of energy. And Mayo Sanchez is going to do what he does. He's just going to walk forward. He's going to light. He's going to throw strikes. The one thing that I'm saying the reason why he's getting overlooked, if you go back and you watch the Daniel Baisho fight, is that he ripped the body quite a bit. And in the second round, I think it was the second round, he was able to drop Daniel Baisho to the body. And after that, he had done a ton of work on Daniel Baisho to the body. And if he does that and he starts early against Patricio, Patricio's going to have his hands full and making sure that he doesn't exert too much energy and, get, and start to fatigue yes. and slow down to the point where Emmanuel Sanchez can push and push and push. The other thing Emmanuel Sanchez is the reason why he's getting overlooked, and people maybe people don't understand this, he's now got a nutritionist. And his weight cuts now are a lot easier. He physically feels a lot better. His performances have shown since he's gotten one. His fight after he had Patricio, after he fought Patricio and lost, he realized he could have fought better had he just dialed in his nutrition, had he had more energy to train, had he had, like, all those little things. Sure. He just knew that he could have been better, and he went out and made those changes. Yeah. And, so, and so then that helps, I think, I believe, is going to help push him as the fight goes on. Yeah, the, the, the little details. The little details that champions find. And one thing you didn't even mention yet that always stands out to me is this op absolute insane output that this guy does yeah. that it could be even better if he's you know, getting his nutrition right. Let's move over to light heavy real quick because, you know, that's the new, you know, the yeah. new Grand Prix. Everyone's excited about it. Um, I want to put a pin on the champion for a second, Nemkov. I want to talk about uh, Anthony Rumble Johnson, Yo Romero. We've seen Romero recently. We haven't seen Johnson. Johnson's been out for four years. He bulked way yeah. up. We saw the pictures of him looking like the rock, you know, with muscle on muscle. And he was always obviously an extremely muscle the guy. But what do you expect from him? Because, you know, obviously people are excited. You're talking about one of the most dynamic fighters in ever, some of the best highlight reel ever. But then, of course, you're going to have the naysayers. are going to say, he's 36 now. He hasn't fought in four years. Like, People might be getting a little, you know, last time we saw him, he lost, you know, like, what are you expecting? Like, what camp are you in? Well, I, I don't know if people really understand, <clears throat> I don't know if they understand or know my relationship with AJ. My relationship with AJ is the reason why AJ is in the UFC is because of me. Back when he first got in is I was able to hook him up with a, with a manager who was able to get him into the UFC. Um, he was actually supposed to be on the ultimate fighter. So my relationship with him is, do I think he's going to win? I think he has all the abilities to win. Um, the four years off, I think he's going to play a factor. <clears throat> and then the biggest thing that's going to play a factor is his kryptonite has always been someone that can wrestle. You know, when you get to the ground on the bottom, he has a hard time getting up, but he's hard to take down. But that being said, Yoel Romero is a next level wrestler. Yeah. You know, he's not, I mean, if you want to com compare the level of wrestling between someone like DC who was able to take him down and Yoel Romero, Yoel Romero has got a better world action. champion. He was world yeah. champion. Yeah. In terms of wrestling. And so, but Yoel also doesn't like to use his wrestling. Whereas I DC know. Will, he, will, he will go to the well on that as much as he possibly can, yeah. you know, to the win. So all of that being said, that's his kryptonite. But also <clears throat> you said 36, Yoel Romero is 44. Yeah, no, I know, I know. I was just focusing on, yeah, you're right, absolutely. And that's, but that's why he doesn't use his wrestling. It's exhausting. It's, yeah. You know, it's exhausting at 22, let alone at 44. And sure. so when we're, we're making these comparisons, Anthony's got the, the chance and the ability. He's a big guy. He's bigger than Yoel, uh, physically bigger yeah. and longer. He's definitely, I think, I feel like he's faster. But he's been out of the game for four years. I'm going to give the advantage 
to Yoel, but we may potentially see the the first time Yoel being knocked out. Yeah. Because I, I don't. I've trained with. I've trained with AJ. I've tr- I've trained with him. I've trained him, and I've trained with him. I've cornered him. I know him very well. Um, I'm sorry, but I've I've never sparred with a guy at you know that walked around at 200 pounds that was that fast twitch and could knock you out yeah. so easy without even really trying. <clears throat> I that's mounted, why he's so popular. I think that's why yeah, even I all these. Time, I, had mounted him, I had mounted him one time in training, and he hit a hammer fist from the bottom from his back. And I kid you not, I went limp for a second. I had to catch myself. Yeah. And, you know, and he was cutting down to 170 at the time, killing himself. And so <clears throat> that happened then. I can't imagine now with the weight behind him how hard he hits. Yeah. So, I mean, look, I want the best for AJ. It's a tough fight for him to come back to because of the wrestling ability of Yoel Romero. <clears throat> but I take the Scott Coker approach in this situation where you have two guys that you can't you can't wish and hope that they will get and meet later sure. on. Yeah. You have to have them fight in the first round. Yeah. And, 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 that, that, <clears throat> and you mentioned that's what you do. Yeah. You mentioned he struggled with wrestling. This the whole field is full of loaded wrestlers. We got, you know, all American Ryan Bader, national champion Phil Davis, all American uh Corey Anderson. So I mentioned all these names, and these are the names everyone's talking about. They're talking about Romero. They're talking about Johnson. They're talking about Bader. It doesn't seem like as many people are talking about Vadim Nemkov, who's been absolutely sensational. Same question I asked about Emmanuel Sanchez. Is he being overlooked? Um, you know, I don't think he's being overlooked. I think what it is is that we've already seen him beat Ryan Bader. We've already seen him beat Phil Davis. And sure, Phil Davis was coming on in the third round. And it's a five-round fight this time. Mm-hmm. But I also think that a lot of confidence has been built by Nemkov. And he understands what happened in the first fight against Phil Davis. And he can't allow that to happen again. And, and I don't want to spout off too many uh, percentages. But this percentage is something like 80% of the guy who won the first fight is per- pretty much going to win the second One fight. Second. It's yeah. something like that, 80-something percent. Yeah. Anyway, and, and I'm good friends with Phil. But when I'm talking percentages, that's what the percentages are. And I think Nemkov understands what Phil Davis' approach is going to be to try and beat him. And he's gonna he's gonna go out there and implement his game plan and continue to try to be the champion. <clears throat> the the um the dark I think the person that's being overlooked completely is Corey Anderson. To me, he's the guy that sure he came over and there was all this hype, but I think Yoel and AJ are getting a lot of the hype, which sure. is good. Which is good. But Corey's Corey's to me is so much he's bigger than both those guys. He's got very fast twitch, and he him and Ryan Bader, him and Machida. Doesn't to me, I don't think makes for an interesting fight. I think Corey Anderson is ha, will be able to have his way with both of those guys. Really? It's wow. Not until he, it's not until he gets to, it's not until he gets to a Nemkov or a Anthony Johnson or a Yolo Romero where I feel like he's going to have some problems. <clears throat> you know, because the, the wrestling itself of Yolo Romero will put Corey Anderson on his back. And and the, the way Joel Romero's ground and pound is, is nasty. Just ask Machida. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And, yeah, and sure. Anthony Johnson, I don't think that Corey Anderson can take Anthony Johnson down. I mean, maybe possibly he can, but I know he can't stand with him. Yeah. You know, and I don't think there's – I don't, I don't think he want wants to either. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he wants to either. Yeah. So, but they don't – I don't think Bellator did Nemkov any favors either by putting him on that side of the bracket. Yeah, it's – I know. I know. It's – it's, it's it's fun. You mentioned a lot of question marks. There's a lot of, can he take this guy down? Can this guy stand up? It's, it's a good question to have to start your grand, your grand prix. There's things that make guys exciting. Uh, let me ask you, we, we're, we're running out of time. Uh, I appreciate the time. Let me ask you one more question. We, we started talking about Bellator, talking about stars. I said, AJ McKee is the guy that I would plant my flag in. This is the guy. This is who I, if I was running Bellator, this is the guy I want to be the face of the organization. Give me somebody that you think could be a star but maybe someone that no one's expecting. Like a, one year from today, who could be a star that nobody's really uh, talking about? Okay, okay. Uh, <clears throat> Logan Storley, he's one of them. I know he's coming off of a loss to uh, Yaroslav Amosov. Who's got <laughs> undefeated. Best yeah, he's, got, uh, he's undefeated. He's 25 or 26 and 0. I think he's 25 and 0 now. Um, he's got the best record in all of MMA now that Khabib is retired. Um, he's, you know, and he came from another promotion before he fought in Bellator, but he's got nothing but wins. You know, he's never lost. And I want people to remember, he, he never wrestled like when he was younger. He just started picked up, you know, fighting and Sambo and just kind of jumped into it. And, and now he's, 
he's stopping takedowns by guys like Logan Storley and it's making crazy. it work. He's gassing them out and and he's and he's taking down guys like Ed Ruth for hip toss and throws and 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 Ed Ruth is a three time national champ from Penn State. Yeah. I mean, this is how good this guy is. And I mean, his he's he's somebody that people should look out for. But Logan Storley is right there as well. Yeah. And if you watch that fight between the two of them, it really was a barn burner. Sure. It was it down. It came down to the last round where both guys couldn't take each other down, and they had no choice but to stand and bang with each other. And so it was it ended up being a wonderful fight, a great fight. Could have went either way. Um, I I went with the judges. I thought Amosov won, but barely, barely won. It was a yeah. close fight. Um, outside of that, <clears throat> um, you know, I mean, Magomed Magomedov, who we had just signed. Yeah. But let, look, the one guy, and, and and there's a guy that obviously not a lot of people are. There's two of them actually. Is Khabib's brother, is Usman yeah. Magomedov. You have him, and then you also got Alexander Sh- Shabli. Shabli, I think is how you say his last name. But he's out of ATT. I've sparred with him and trained with him and worked with him. He's a savage. So between Usman and I'm not just trying to blow sunshine up everyone's booty here, but the bottom line is those two guys in the 155 pound division versus any of the guys in the 155 pound division in Bellator is going to be fire. It's going to be electric. You have so many guys that are in that division that may cause cause some problems for them, but it's going to be fun. Like Alexander Shabli or whatever, Shabli, I think that's how you say his name, Shabli. He's good. He's good on the feet, good at stopping takedowns. And all the buzz and the talk out of ATT is that he's like one of the main training partners for for uh, Masvidal and does very well with Dustin Poirier, very trains with him quite frequently, does very well with both of them. And um, you know what I mean? So we're talking top, top level and relatively unknown. He's a good looking kid. Same thing with, with Usman, very good looking kid, speaks English, you know, well. Um, those are things that are make them very marketable and their fighting style will make them marketable as well. Usman is not like Khabib, where he wrestles a lot. He does wrestle. He's very good at wrestling. Does but a lot he does have a style of double legs. He's got more of the type. He has more of a Umar from Argumentov style of fighting. The side, the side stance. The karate style. Of, yeah. Yeah, karate style, but mixed in with a lot of the, the Sambo style of wrestling, that Dagestani style of wrestling. Yeah. So those are two guys I feel that you could potentially build star to, to build power around. But let's not recall. Let's not forget. If AJ McKee wins the featherweight world title, He's not going to hang out at featherweights. Yeah, he already said that. Yeah, he ain't hanging out at featherweights. He will have already decided he's done everything he needs to do, and he cuts a massive amount of weight, and he will go up to 155. Yeah. All right, I lied. I got one more question for you. Of You're back, back, uh, back on uh, Showtime. One to one to ten. How excited are you? <clears throat> I'm a ten. And I'm not just saying that because <laughs> I work for them. I'm not. I'm not just saying that. Um, they're.
All right, guys, we are on to the second segment. This is the present segment where I talk to a fighter that is doing big things. This is a guy that would have fit on the future one not that long ago. If you've ever listened to any show that I've done on Sherdog sure or on Loudmouth MMA, this is a guy that's been on my radar a long time. I've been talking this guy up for a long time, and this guy's making me look really good because he is absolutely killing it. He is fighting this weekend at UFC 259 where he puts on his three-fight winning streak on the line when he takes on former UFC uh, Bantamweight champion Dominic Cruz. He, of course, as you already see on the screen, is Casey Kenny. Casey, how you doing, my man? I'm doing great. You know, final week of camp and uh, fight week's my favorite week. So I'm looking forward to heading to Vegas on Tuesday and getting this whole thing uh, rolling. You know, not just the fight, but... You know, the weigh-in, well, not necessarily cutting the weight, but sure, everything sure. about fight week is uh, is amazing, man, so I'm ready for it. Yeah. Well, you may, you might not have that much weight to cut. I mean, you're, you're a form of flyweight. So, right. You know. uh, well, I've been working on getting a little bit bigger. Sure, you know, sure. Like, uh, you know, Wood Wood and I both walked into the octagon the same exact weight. Okay, uh, there you go. Uh, I'm about 10 pounds. My last three fights in the UFC, I've walked in about 10 pounds bigger than my first three. Okay. So, uh, I'm officially a bantamweight now, but they, not not a super huge bantamweight. Sure, so it's not as bad as a weight cut. Sure. Um, so let's get into this. You went, you just mentioned you went to Wood. Wood was your last matchup. Uh, your opponent Dominic Cruz. His last matchup was for the title. Like, so you guys were no disrespect to, to Nathaniel Wood. He's a very good prospect in his, in his own sense, but you're kind of going from a little further perspective than we normally see. Are you right. were you surprised by this matchup? Maybe a little bit, but I think their plan for me was after the Wood fight was to get a top 15 opponent. And, you know, Dominic's sitting at number 11. Uh, I tried to get matched up with Song Yudong in December. Uh, yeah. That was done on my end. Uh, he backed out last minute. So when that happened, it was like, okay, who's next? And I think they kind of went up, you know, up the ladder. And there came Dominic Cruz, who is, you know, he kind of explained it on the Ariel Hawani show last night. Um, you know, he's wanting to not jump into a title fight, but make a title run, and needs to start with taking out some up and comers. So, sure. it's a uh, as a fan perspective too. I feel like it's a great matchup. You know, you got the up and comer versus the veteran. See if he still still has it. And, yeah. Uh, both got it. both uh both our times to shine. Yeah, it's not bad when Dominic Cruz becomes the consolation prize. Yeah, you, you know, right. he's yeah, usually I'll the grand prize. It, I'll take it. Yeah. So uh, so let's get into it. Um, but let's, let's actually let's go back a little bit. When you were on the rise, like I know you mentioned in his interview that he just did with Ariel Hawani, one thing he said was, you know, you were winning world championships before this guy was like even a professional. You know, right. what, how did you view, you know, Dominic Cruz before you started fighting, or or when you were just on the regional scene? Um, you know, you can't take away from anything that he's done. I think it was amazing how he came back from his injuries too and uh, regained his belt. You know for even defended it after he got it back when i first saw dominic cruz i was talking about being a fighter i was like back in like 2011 sure uh, i was watching ufc fights at that time with all my friends and it was when he fought faber in the first their first actual fight in the ufc or the first fight in the actual ufc sure yeah. the last wc but um I was like, you know, not necessarily those guys uh, right this second, but I never would have thought I, I'd be facing one of those guys now once I got into the sport. Here we are almost a decade later. Um, it's it's pretty surreal, but, you know, he's just another guy in front of me uh, in, my, in my way to my ultimate goal um, yeah. on March 6th. So you've been in the UFC for a while. You've been extremely successful. Does it feel any different this time? You know, it's a much bigger platform like it's a bigger name like does the preparation for it seem any different not really i think you know at this level they're all big fights they're all you know uh and honestly after my crazy fight island month you know i feel like i can conquer the world uh there's no fight week there's no you know uh nerves or anything that's gonna really throw me off course you know uh another it's been the training camp's been the same you know obviously focused a little bit on dominant Cruz, but I focus most of it on on myself and sharpen what I, what I do well. Yeah. Now let's talk about Dominic Cruz, just the stylistic matchup wise. Mm -hmm. Do you still view him as one of the top guys? Because his last two fights, you know, and they were both title fights with Cody Garbrandt and Henry Sudo, He did not look well at all. I mean, he, Cody Garbrandt gave him one of the 
biggest beatdowns in, in the title fight history. And then his last fight, he was stopped. Like, I, like, how do you view him? Do you still think he's that like championship level guy or not? I I never want to count anybody out, and I'm you know I don't never want to count him out. But uh, I think his style was very u- new and unique back when he was winning all his championships. He was a little bit younger. His style was a lot of based off of speed, youth, cardio, which, you know, always starts to go away a little bit in your older years. I'm not saying he's not dangerous and can't do what, what Dominic Cruz does, but of I think he, he can't do it as well as he used to do it 10 years ago. Yeah. And uh, we'll find out, though. Yeah, he's a guy that, you know, he uses – you know, elusive movement so much. Yep. That was the biggest part of his game. He got older, but also those injuries that he's always had, that stuff could actually finally catch up to him too, you know? Right. And just to take any age from him away or injuries or anything like that, his switching stances and movement was never seen before. That's now true. everybody does it. You know, we're, I, I see it in the gym every single day. I've yeah. seen it. In the, I've begun, you know, fighting. Um, I think that's where – it's not so new to everybody as well. And I think that's where I'm going to capitalize. Yeah. The first thing you said was, I don't want to, you know, look past him or let me flip that. I, you just mentioned the Errol Hawani interview. He did a, about a 30 minute interview with him and I just listened mm-hmm. to, you know, I got to prep as you would in 30 minutes. I think he talked about you for about 30 seconds. Yeah. You know, do you think, you know, he talked about Henry Cejudo. He talked about referees. He talked about his prediction for the main event. He talked about mm-hmm. Corey Sanhagen's knockout. He talked about his injuries. Like, he talked about everything but you. Do you think but, he's looking past you? Um, I, You know, it doesn't really bother me either way. If he does, that's going to be his own mistake. But I know where my mind's at. I'm 100% focused. Uh, I know Dom's, he's got a lot going on in his life. And, you know, he's... I don't think he was doing it out of disrespect. Anytime he said something about me, you know, he, he it seemed like it was good words and he thought sure. highly of me. But I think he's got a bigger plan in store than just me, as yes. as do I. You know, we're we're both after that belt, and if yeah. he wants to make another serious run, you know, I got to get through him. He's got to get through me. So uh, I don't think he's looking past me. I think you know he's got some plans and he's a long term type of guy. And uh, yeah. You know, it just happened to be that way. You know, Ariel was uh, trying to pull some stuff out of him anyway. So uh, the topic wasn't too heavy on me. But uh, I bet next time they talk, it's going to be a little bit heavier on the Casey Kenny subject. Sure. And and, and, and t- I understand what Ariel's doing. He's trying to get right. a couple headlining sound bites that, that, you know, get retweets on Twitter if he says something negative about Cejudo or the main – whatever. Yeah, I understand right. that. So uh, – how about just a stylistic matchup? Like, I know you were a f- little offended or, you know, a little, I shouldn't say offended, but a little, a little pissed off about, well, you know, his comments when you first debuted about your wrestling. Like, where do you think you have an advantage on him without obviously giving away your game plan? Like, where you say, like, right. if this, if we get in this position, I'm going to win it. Right. And, uh, you know, to go back to the that comment about the commentator, com- I mean, I was, wasn't uh, upset, but. I did get taken down a lot, so I used it as fuel to go work on my wrestling, go work on my cage work instead of, you know, the kind of the oh I, I, I'm upset by your comment. I'm like, you know, you're you know what, you kind of were right, you were right, Dom, but I wasn't too, you know, too butthurt about it. Um, sure, it, it's all good. Um, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, do you feel like he didn't give you enough credit in the fight? Because if, if I recall, you took that fight at short notice, didn't you? Right. Yeah. You took a short I notice. You kind of, yeah, I know there's you, a lot of things to go into it, you know, the Borg style, that whole thing. But he, uh, I get it. So he's a, he's a tough stylist matchup because you're a big wrestler. He's a big wrestler. Uh, he's obviously at that point in their career, he was a, a lot more experienced than you. You, I know you kind of played around between flyweight and bantamweight on the Raiders team. So you kind of was going in the heavier weight class, taking it on short right. notice. And then you're going against Ray Borg. I mean, this is a guy who fought for the <laughs> title. Like, this wasn't, this isn't your most people's debut fight. And then you won. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, you know, uh, definitely. I got taken down a few times, but I feel like I didn't get quite enough credit for, uh, you know, what I was doing. I'd fought the weekend before as well. You know, they mentioned it a few times, and they gave me uh, they gave me a little bit of credit. But you know, it's the UFC, man. You got to come in and prove yourself. They they got guys coming in every day, so sure, uh, it's their right. You know, good on them to be hard on you know some of the newcomers. Yeah. But um, I think stylistically, Dominic Cruz. Uh, like I said, I think his style was unique 10, five, 10 years ago, but uh, I've seen similar styles 
you know, no one does it quite like Dominic, but I don't think Dominic does it quite like Dominic anymore either. So not to put words in your mouth, but you think it's just kind of like he's kind of – he was the head of the pack, and the pack has caught up to him and kind of surpassed him. And, and like anything in sports, like sports evolve and guys get better. and they Right, things. exactly. And then it's just, you know, there's – you see it every day in mixed martial arts, the changing of the guard, the young guy coming right. up and uh, the old guy trying to prove themselves. You know, and it's, it's, you've seen them both ways. And I believe that, you know, I've been preparing a long time for this. You know, I may be the new guy, but Dominic Cruz only has six more fights than me. You know, this is my 20th professional fight. I've been very active. I've won three sure. world titles, um, you know, fought uh, UFC caliber guys for the last – 12 fights that I've been in maybe even longer um I'm prepared I'm ready and I think you know he he knows what's going to come at him and I, I don't think he's overlooking me though any 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 extra motivation to want it to turn into a wrestling match to kind of show him a that, little that bit you might you know, have better I, I, probably feel like I might have to get a takedown or two in there but yeah if I can go in there put my hands on him put my feet on him put knees elbows everything it's going to be a good night yeah, and that's and you mentioned you put feet on him. That's something we saw recently that uh, me and my my recap buddy Ben Duffy we do the recap show. We were going crazy in the fight where you threw about two hundred kicks in a row. I, I kept saying like, you know, his opponent, uh, your opponent was obviously batted up, and I'm like, man, how does Casey's foot feel? Like I just kept thinking that. Like, like yeah, how how, it, how much was your foot hurting in that fight? It was a, well in the fight. I didn't really feel it too much, but it was a little it was a little bruised, a little swollen. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't hit any pads in between the the Alatang and the Wood fight because yeah. my foot was still healing. I let it heal for those three weeks. And uh, I didn't even kick the tie pads and warming up for the Wood fight. And then I went out there, and you kind of go out, and the first body kick, I kicked him right in the elbow, right on the couple sore spots I had from the other one. And I stepped back and was like, oh, man, I, I feel that. So yeah. uh, that's something, you know, people – People saw, but didn't really think a whole about, a lot about the wood fight. My, sure. my feet were kind of, they weren't, they weren't a hundred percent, but you know, no excuses. I was still throwing them, still moving, but I definitely felt, you know, the Alatang fight after the wood fight too. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you had, but I just kept thinking, uh, man, this next one, this next one's going to put him down, right? This next kick's going to put him down. And then 15 minutes went by and he was battered. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was throwing out like ten seven rounds. It was it was a a absolute slaughter. And 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 Preeks tape study, Alatang was good too. You know, yeah, it's a yeah. very good quality win. So I, I saw an interview you did, and you kind of laid out the game plan. You said, "Hey, I want to do a little legend tour. I want to take out Dominic Cruz, and then hey, how about Jose Aldo? How about Frank Edgar? Is that like the, like that? What you got to ask for? You got to ask for one of these guys? Is that the plan? Yeah, man. Um, you know, you beat a former champion. Why not another former champion? Beat a, you beat a handful of former champions, you know, normally you get a title shot. And uh, there's a lot of them up there. You know, there's Aldo, Garbrandt, Dillashaw. Edgar was kind of in the mix. Yeah, there's um, a lot of them. Not, not completely out, but, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe wait on Edgar, let him get his steam back again. Sure. And then, you know, you got Jan and Sterling up there, uh, Sanhagen. I mean, it's it's a crazy it's a division. It's a loaded but, division. It's absolutely loaded. You know, so... You just mentioned two names. You said Jan and Sterling. They're they're fighting on the card. Uh, you know, say you know you win, you get your, your coverage. You do the doctor's thing. You do all the things you have to do in the back. You do the media. You know, and you're done. Uh, how much are you watching that matchup? Are you are you going to be that intro? Like you got to make sure you're watching that thing. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a fight fan still sure. to this day, and uh, not especially when the belt that I'm coming after is is on the line. When uh, I mentioned December twelfth date. They were originally booked for that, and that's why I gave uh, that date. That I, that's what I wanted to return was because that fight was on that card. Ultimately, it didn't work out, but it did work out because they they got moved as well to this March one. Yeah. So, um, you know, that was that was something that was on my mind immediately after the Wood fight. I want to go fight during the bantamweight title to you know take a look at it and you know people people talk about you when when that that's on the line you do something great on that night sure absolutely yeah it makes a lot of sense let me ask you this who do you like in that matchup and uh sterling's tough but i think john gets it done okay you know i think i think uh his grappling's tough uh i don't think sterling will put him away he may take him down ride him out in the first but I think second, third, Jan starts to pull away, defending okay. the takedowns, getting up, start lighting him up. 
Yeah. yeah. Jan's a little bit of a slow stutter, too. That's kind of his style. Like, he kind of cruises a little bit in the first, kind of sets his traps and learns, kind of, uh, as a, as a Calvin Cater's coach says, downloads the information, like, there's something yeah. that he does to do. Let me ask you this. It's not out of the realm of possibility. You know, it's happened before, I think, at Joe Soto versus TJ Dillashaw, where he was in the weight class, something happened in the main event, he was in it. You're right there. Yep. Is that in your back and mind? Like, you know, it's COVID season. You know, we have fights every single week canceled if one of them are out is there any way you'd just say yeah yeah, i'll jump at the title shot or or interim title versus sterling yeah um actually i was supposed to corner anthony burchek against joe soto when he jumped in Uh, oh really he he jumped in against dillashaw in sacramento yeah yeah we didn't we ended up not having a fight but i was supposed to corner against soto Random, random fact there, but oh, yes, there you I go. did think about I did think about that as well. Uh, there's a couple bantamweight fights on the card, but uh, I'm I'm the epitome of any time, anywhere, any place. I will fight one of those guys if if need be. Um, I think it would probably get moved, but sure, I would definitely step up and fight Jan. Just step up and fight Sterling, no problem. Yeah, you know, I would maybe like to prepare it a little differently for a five rounder, but I've been five rounds before. So yeah, and then. How about this? What about the other thought in the back of mind that they go the other direction? They go with the former champion, Cruz jumps in, and now suddenly you don't even have an opponent. Right. Uh, I thought about that too, and that would probably be more realistic. But, hey, uh, I think, you know, I'll, I'll roll with the punches. Uh, that's part of, you know, being a fighter. As sure. You can see during COVID season, it's you never know until we're stepping in that octagon. And if you're Chaz Skelly, you're not even oh, quite geez. sure. Uh, you're not that's even right. Sure if that's gonna happen. So uh, anything can happen, man. How crazy was that? Uh, yeah, that's I always good... have those weird thoughts when I walk out first when I'm in the ring or the octagon. I'm kind of like, ah, oh, they're gonna trip and fall. They're gonna something's gonna happen. Right? Yeah, they hurt themselves in the back, and then I watched it live. You Unreal. Know, I it it, it, it's funny because they kept saying it was the first time it happened, and it's not true. Going right. all the way back to UFC 3. I think I'm the only one who's tweeting this out. Hoist Gracie yeah. and Harold Howell were both in the cage. And then Hoist Gracie's t- corner threw in the towel. So so Harold Howell is also in a, in the cage and never got the fight. That's that's a trivia that I kept screaming at the UFC. Stop saying it's the first time it ever happened. And Vito Belfort tried doing it to Randy Couture once too. Uh, at uh, UFC 16-ish, 14-ish, something like that. Um, the day of the fighting? Yeah, they did. They did, but Vito did this big, long, like, delay. It was, like, 10 minutes making Randy, like, stay out there. And uh-huh. uh, that was their very first fight. So you said, you know, any place, any time, you know, the – I don't want to say – a little cliche, but how about any yeah. weight class? Like, is, is flyweight still an option for you, or is that completely done? Um, at this moment, no. You know, nothing really excites me down there. Um, I'm in – I think the – the bantamweight division is super hot, and it's sure the, it is for little guys. It's the biggest any division's ever been. So you know, I want to beat the game on expert, and yeah. uh, you know that's that's what really drives me. Uh, on top of cutting the weight, like I may be able to make you know I I could probably make twenty five if I you know had the right camp and the right diet, sure. and, you know. But now I got six to eight weeks. You know, I'm not doing my fight island thing. I'm not doing easily switching you know easily switching dates and that type of stuff uh, making those incredible weight cuts and you know like i said i backed on probably about the 10 pounds that uh i, I used to give up sure. when i was weight. so um it's still a little bit of a weight cut but yeah. it's still not as deep you know the last couple pounds at flyweight you get to a dark dark place oh, I, I can't remember. and you're getting you're getting older obviously your body's maturing you're, right you know i don't want to say you that, yeah it just happens. That was part of it as well, you know. Through my twenties, I was I was just naturally getting bigger, and uh, sure. I knew it would probably come. And then, uh, you know, it was like, all right, we're switching right now. <laughs> now. Do you feel better, like overall better? Like you feel like you're a better fighter at bantamweight? Yeah, definitely. I think um, I can. I feel like I'm pushing myself as an elite athlete at bantamweight. Before sure. I, I felt like I was fighting a weight cut first and foremost, yeah, and yeah. then second i was my opponent it's like okay who am i fighting you know now i'm just having fun i'm you know eating good uh still dieting still doing most of the stuff but just not you know trying to do a training camp on a thousand calories 1200 calorie diets you know 
Um, and you get real fragile and, and real injury prone too. That's another thing that a lot of people don't think about, but yeah. It, it, so weight cutting is obviously such a negative part of the sport. It's part of negative part of all comments, but you, I come from a wrestling background. I know you grew up wrestling and what I, one thing that is positive is the changing of philosophy where it comes, where I'm sure you probably the same situation I was in. It was always try to be the biggest guy, cut a bunch of weight. And it seems like guys are having so much success moving up, being more hydrated, have, eating better. And it, it, it's so, see me, it's a very positive change. You, you agree with me? I do agree. Um, I think that is, you know, obviously, like I still cut, you know, around 20 some pounds, but yeah. there's a point where it gets to, you know, you're, you're dieting to, uh, you're dieting 20 pounds to get to another 10 pound water cut. And now you're 30, 35 pounds Scary. below your normal weight. And, you know, people do it. I've been, I've been cutting weight since I've been 10 years old. Yeah. I did it at flyweight uh, all the time. I did it through high school. I was a big 103 pounder, you know, uh, 103, yeah. 103 pounder freshman, sophomore and junior year. And you then, were before uh, they changed it to 106, huh? Yep, I was before. Yeah, that. Oh, that sucks. I was the last of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, you know, so I've, I've, I've had all those advantages, and you know, it is part of it. You know, even when I got to bantamweight, I was giving up probably like ten pounds my first three fights sure. uh, in there, and I went, well, this is nice. I don't have to cut weight, but I need to gain that ten pounds back. Sure. And, uh, you know, so I don't think it. It's always part of the sport. But I think there's a certain way to do it now and a certain amount. You know, if everyone backs off 10 pounds, there's probably still cutting weight. Yeah, yeah. But just not to the crazy extent. Yeah. All right. We're, we ran out of time, guys. I apologize. But I got to get you one last question. You know this is all the betters sure. like to do. I ask all the guys who's fighting, give me your official prediction. I want round. I want how, you know, if we want to make money on Casey Kenny, I'm going to bet what? I would bet first round finish. First, first right round. knockout first submission knockout first round mm. tko there knockout. you go there you go he yep. just said so i'm going to interpret what he's saying because sometimes people don't speak fighter talk what he actually just said he says he's guaranteeing that he's going to knock him out in the first round and he said he's actually going to beat jorge masvidal's record he's going to do it under five <laughs> seconds so uh tweet that me. tweet that out there Make sure. No, I'm just kidding, guys. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, he is cost is Casey Kenny Casey. We wish you good luck in this fight and all future fights. We appreciate you taking the time speaking with us. For sure, man. Uh, always a pleasure, and uh, can't wait till next time. All right, guys. We got one more segment left. We got Jacob Silva. He's fighting this weekend. Also, stick around. All right, guys. We are back. We're in the third segment of the show. Before I get to my final guest, I want to thank our last guest, Casey Kenny, who's fighting. This weekend at UFC 259 against Dominic Cruz, I move on to a guy uh, that if you're a fan of the Dana White Contender Series, you'll definitely know this guy. He had two appearances this past weekend. He returns to action this weekend at Fury FC 44 when he takes on Carlos Begara for the Flyweight Championship. He is Jacob Silva. Jacob, how you doing, my man? Hey, what's up, everyone? Hey, man, I'm doing great, man. Actually, I, I man, hey, I, I feel honored and blessed to, you know, even be on on the show, man. Well, Thank you. Well, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, that's really nice. I, I don't know if I get honored and blessed off it, but it's, uh, it's very nice well, to say. Bro, because, I mean, I don't really, you know, get too many interviews. Like, like to be honest, um, I've probably done, like, four. Like, yeah. So, like, so whenever someone wants to, you know, give me a free interview, I'm like, Really? Like, yes. And like, yeah, cool. I'm down. Like, cool. Yes, cool. thank you. And, and let me guess, so, was, hey, hey, man, this is honored, man. Cool. Thanks. I appreciate it. So is all the interviews you get, is that, uh, was that mostly from the Contender Series? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's it. I yeah. get it. Yeah, yeah, I get None it. of them. I never got any, like, prior, you know? And then uh, once that came about, then I'm not going to say all of them because it was maybe a freaking handful. Like, like I sure, said, sure. it's. It, it not much, you know. And then I, uh, I really didn't have a, a a manager, so I didn't have someone trying to push my name out there as much until my uh, till after my last contender series fight is when I finally got with a manager. Okay. And uh, so 
like, hey, a lot of my interview that I was getting at first, it was just me, like, you know, like, hey, you know, I'm fighting on this card. Do you want to give me a freaking interview? You know, that's how it, sure, it, sure. it, it, it pretty much was. I, so, you know, like I said, I, I was really doing everything myself. And, I mean, it was really stressful, man. I'm not going to lie. It was very stressful trying to get interviews just to, like, try to get my name, try to get, get my face out there some. And then now with the uh, uh, new new management, I mean, I don't even have to stress about that stuff now. Yeah, no, that's definitely where to go. I, I try to tell all young fighters, you definitely got to get a manager. You got to get the right manager, too. You one that uh, knows what fights to get you in, what organization to get you in, get your name out to the different places. I mean, we don't – think about all the other things. You don't you – don't, you, you, you have – Plumbing problems, you call a plumber. You got financial problems, you get a retirement planner, you know. Same thing yes. with your career. You got to get the person that can focus on that, knows the ins and outs, get a professional. Uh, so let's get into exactly. it. So you had two appearances on the Contender Series this year, and neither one went your way, but both oh of them gosh. were controversial. So let's, yeah, let's get that's... into it. So the first fight against Jeff Molina was extremely close fight. It was, it was one of the, one of the best fights of the entire season. Um, Thank you, D Dana White was complimentary of obviously him, but also complimentary of you. He mentioned wanting to get you, uh, you know, right back in there, whether it was on the contender series or he mentioned short notice fights. Obviously, the flyweight division. Yeah. When I want to go back to when the the first round was very close, the second round. I think most people gave it to him. And then the third round, you really came on strong. I think that was definitely your best round. You kind of finished with a flurry, which made it even more exciting. When you go into the decision, that, that you know, three, four-minute wait, what, what's going through your head? Like, did you think you won? Um, You know what? To be honest, I, uh, I for some reason, my whole career, I've had uh, – I, I just parked, actually. Uh, for some reason, my whole career, I've – I probably won maybe one decision, uh, maybe two decisions in my whole career, you know. And uh, uh, so, like, my mindset is, like, if I don't finish the person, then I really didn't do my job of, like, securing my, my finish, you know. Um, I, I've, I've had – I have a, a lot of friends who uh, they, they fight, and the fight goes the distance, and they, they lose, you know. And, and I've been on that, that same – same end of the stick, you know, if the fight goes to a decision and I lose. Yeah. And, uh, and I believe I, I said this in one of my past interviews that if the fight goes the distance, you know, I'm, I'm probably gonna lose. It's yeah. just, I mean, it's not that I didn't perform my best. It's just that I just, I, I, I just always feel like, you know, for some reason I, I won't get the, the damn, um, um, decision. So, uh, and then as a personal, as a personal, you know, um, I guess way to win is, you know, my job is to finish the person, you know. And so I like, even if, if, if I would have if I, even if I would have won, I would have still been like, shit, I didn't finish this guy. You know, like I didn't really do my job, you know. Yeah. But it, I mean, it, one card, it was a very close fight. It, it if was. You look at the stats. If you look at the stats, it was very close. We were neck to neck. Like, you know, uh, I mean, it was a, a good fight. You know, Jeff, Jeff was tough. Jeff's good. Is is that why you came on so hard so late? Like you were trying to get that finish? Is that because you did you feel like you needed the finish? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I I felt like so on the first round. I thought I won the first round, right? And then at the end when I rushed him, he clipped he me. He caught you, yeah. And and then like I was like, man, like I'm thinking like, okay, the the freaking judges they only gonna remember that little yeah. ending, you know, at the very end when I got clipped and. That was really the only little highlight he had because I think I knocked I, I knocked him down two or three times in the first round and then, you know, that little clip was like at, at the buzzer. So I'm, I'm going into the second round like, shit, I just got clipped, you know. But it, it didn't hurt or anything. Then the second round came, you know, we was trading off. And then he caught me with the, knee, um, with the head kick. I think that was the second round. And, uh, you know... I was just, you know, I freaking, I fucking ate that kick, and I was just, you know, walking forward. And then uh, the third round, my coach was like, "Hey, Jacob, you know, you got to turn it on. You know, this is it. This is the last, the last round. You know, you don't know sure. if you're gonna come back or what." So then, uh, so that third round, you know, I, I just picked up the pace, and I knew he wasn't gonna, uh, you know, have that type of cardio as me. 
So, like, I was just pushing and pushing. And, and I mean, if, if the fight would have went, let's say, one more round, I would have probably broke him, you know? Sure. But, uh, I mean, you know, the fight was on his, on, on his schedule for three rounds. You know, yeah. I, 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 I didn't get it done within three, you know? And uh, it is what it is, you know? The the fight was a fucking dog fight, man. That fight was fun. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely was. Now, let's get to your second fight because if we think the first one was controversial – I mean, oh the God. second one. Now, I do the Contender Series previews. That's what I do for sure, Doug. Um, yeah. JB Byers was one of the one of the prospects that I was like, man, this guy's wrestling is world class, this and that. You know, he's definitely got to watch mm-hmm. out for. You had your first round. The very end of the first round, he jumps on a guillotine. You're on top of him, so he's laying down. Your head is tucked down. If people don't know what I'm talking about, your head is tucked down. You're right mm-hmm. against the fence. So in fairness to Mark Goddard, the referee, he couldn't go on the other side because you're blocked by the fence. Yeah. He job jumped in about four or five seconds if he thought you were yeah. unconscious. Because in a lot of times, you know, in the gist of the world, you try to stay calm. They've let them flex their muscles, you know, control exactly. your control your own breathing, which I'm assuming you were doing. Yep. He yep. thought you were out. He jumped in. You immediately. It wasn't one of these. You woke up. You immediately. Like I don't think. Yeah. I don't think JP even like go with you. You were already screaming. I'm okay. Yeah. And Goddard was saying it's over. It's over. Obviously, there's nothing he could do at that point. Uh, to fairness to both to JP, you know, fairness to JP, he made him let go of a move. Has 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 Mark Gardner talked to you about that at all? Because no, I've never spoken to him uh, at all. Uh, the only time I spoke to him was was in the cage, and uh, I was like, you know, did you ask me? Uh, did uh, did you check? And he's like, no, it's over, it's over, it's over. And I was like, what the fuck, you know? So then I was getting mad, but then. My coach was talking to me, and then he was like, Jacob, just calm down. And then uh, Mark went to go talk to my coach. So then I just left alone, and I was like, you know, it is what it is, you know. Uh, you know, you can't really do anything about it. But, I mean, you, you know, you're right. Like, as soon as uh, Mark touched my shoulder, and then I could feel him, like, trying to pull um, Bai's arm off me, like, you know, I I popped up. Cause I, I I knew he was trying to I I I could hear hear him saying like like stop you know like like um for him to like that the fight was done so yeah. as soon as JP he like released the a lock um uh, I I popped up out of no like like I'm I'm not out you know like yeah, yeah. Just, just like you just like you said I I popped up instantly because I I knew he stopped the fight and I'm like no like why like my coach was like ten seconds left. And then I heard the tap, so I was like, "Well, you know what? I'm just gonna just try to rest." And uh, you, you know, for for uh, JP's, uh, I guess, I guess, um, defense. You know, yes, I was snoring, but you know, my neck is like this. I'm like trying to, you know, stay calm, and I'm just trying to, you know, breathe as much as, as I can. And, uh, but I was not like nowhere near out. I knew what was going on. Yeah. You know, but, uh, like I said, I, I was not out at all. And, uh, you, you know, you know, JP did his job, you know, he went in there, went for subs after subs after sub, which I knew he was going to do, you know, um, that takedown he threw was freaking slick. Like I didn't even see it coming yeah. at all. all right. I mean, this, and, this world, this world-class guy. I mean, this is not just, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, not your local high school wrestler. He's he's I don't know his credentials, but it's it's extremely high. It, was oh, yeah, this yeah, yeah, was yeah. the submission tight? Like, was he choking you? The I mean, he wasn't. The submission was not tight. The submission he had the uh, when when he had the freaking arm in that one was tighter than the last one. The, the last one, you know? okay. Yeah, and uh, so so like I said, when I heard the tap, you know, I was like, "Fuck it," you know, I'm just gonna chill. And, 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 you know, try, try to wait it out. And then before I knew it, you know, he stopped the fight. And, and then Mark even came to the back and he's like, Hey, if, if something happens, you know, you could challenge the call, uh, and stuff. I said, all right, cool. You know, and, and then something did happen, but we weren't allowed to challenge the, the, the stoppage for some reason. So right. I was like, okay. Cause they had like. Cause that was the, the first fight they were doing, like the Las Vegas was doing, like the replay or something like that. Yeah. You know, and so I was like, okay, bro, if there's only five seconds left, like just start the fight on the, in the second round, like you know, five seconds wasn't gonna make a big difference. Sure. You know, and but when they didn't want to do it a freaking replay, so I'm like, 
right. Can you F it? Can you appeal it altogether? Just appeal the uh, loss? Um, I asked my coach about it and he was like, Jacob, he like, don't even waste your time. He like, he like, I don't wanna um he like I, I, I don't think that they will appeal it. He like, you know, he like you're you're not gonna get a contract or anything like that. He like you he like don't don't even waste your time. So I didn't try to or anything. I just, you know, said yeah. fucking, you know. So now uh, on my loss, you know, it is as a uh, sub, you know, like I, yeah. I, I got subbed out. But I, eh, it is what it is, man. I'm, I, I'm done stressing about that, you know. Yeah, yeah you're I'm past, past it. it man. But I, I, I did see he's fighting uh, on the 20th. Baez is, is fighting on the, t- the um, March 20th with my teammate. Adrian Giannis. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so my goal is I win this fight, and then I'm going to Vegas with Adrian to go corner his fight. So then, uh, win this fight, go to Las Vegas with, with Adrian, pray that somebody miss weight or pray that they catch COVID, you know, and then, uh, you know, I'm here till I save the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> step in. Yeah, yeah. I know. I t- I totally understand that. I- I've told a lot, a lot of young fighters like be ready because a lot of people get yeah. that call. Has the UFC indicated anything to you? Because you know Dana White after your first fight was saying, "Hey, this is a guy. We even though he lost, we liked his performance. We we need flyweights. He's right there." Then obviously you get this g- terrible thing that happened in the second match. Have they indicated anything like, "Hey, be ready." Um, no, they haven't indicated anything. Uh, I mean, so I actually spoke to Mick and yeah. then he was like, you know, you, you, you got to get a win, you know, on like, like the local scene. Cause you know, I mean, if you think about it, I just lost two fights back to back, you know? So, uh, he like, you know, you got, you have to get, have to at least get a win, uh, before we could, you know, call you back. So, uh, I reached on understandable, you know, I mean, if, if, if I was them, you know, I probably wouldn't want to sign somebody on a short notice call who sure. just lost two fights. You know, which I mean, it makes sense. You know, maybe yeah. call them back on the you know c- c- contender series, but I, I don't even know when the contender series is is, is going to be aired yeah. again. You know, yeah, summertime but, probably, summertime. So it's yeah, a long time. Uh, so so let me ask you this. So we, obviously, I want to talk about your upcoming matchup, but I, I want to just close close in on the on the contender series for a second. What did you learn from those fights? Man, you know, I, I learned that, uh, you know, I, I can't let move my daughter in the back. <laughs> uh, she's she's trying yeah. to get she's trying to get her own screen time. Watch out, move over, Dad. She's trying to get her own screen I time. See her over there. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I learned that. You know, I need a uh, uh, just from from the bell. Just you know, bring it. Just you know, boss to the wall, man. Honestly, you know, and uh, you know, you can't take anything for granted. You know, uh, uh, my first fight. You know, it was kind of slow. You know, I, I would say when I fought uh, Jeffrey, you know, it it wasn't usually like the pace that I, I fight at. You know, I think I was it was kind of nervous. It was, it was my first time fighting with, with like you know no crowd. You know, it was different. You know, but uh, still, that's yeah, still no uh you know excuse. Um, uh, you know, I I just need to you know pretty much bring it, man. I mean, like the whole weight cutting thing, that was easy, man. I mean, I've never missed weight, you know, all 25 fights, you know, even as an amateur, I fought at 25. I mean, you know, me making 125, that, that's the easy part, you know. Uh, uh, you know, just uh, being on the contender series, it, it it showed me where I uh, know that I need to be at, you know, and, and I, I think I'm, I, I think I, I, I match up pretty well with some of like the flowery fighters now you know sure i mean there's there's not that that many of them you know but uh if there's there's 30 fighters you know i, I mean i think i match up with with uh, at least 20 of them pretty good you know i'm not gonna say every one of them because you know there's some badass guys there you know and i mean i'm 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 working my way there you know but uh i mean yeah man so the uh, contender series that was a freaking honor to even be on on uh, two of those you know for them to call me back for that freaking a second time and then like, like you said you know two really you know con- controversy fights you know uh i i guess you know if it's any bad uh, pub, uh publicity you know it's, it's still good i guess yeah now does does it give you more confidence that you've you fought in the contender series and you were so close or or is it the opposite because you have two losses like 
is it a positive or is it a negative? Um, really, I think it's 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 a positive, but you know, it doesn't really mean anything because I mean, you know, anything could happen. You know, any day. You know, I mean, this guy that I'm fighting, you know, he's pretty good. You know, um, um, you know, he trains under a uh, uh, P. Sprite. You know, who used to yeah, fight yeah. in the, the yeah, yeah. UFC, right? Secret weapon. And yeah, okay. And well, well, P. Sprite used to train on the, my coach, Coach Saul. Um, uh, Solis. So, 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 yeah, Solis. So, so, Solis. So, uh, so, like, it's crazy how, like, the, how, like, the tree works, you know? Yeah. Like, my coach sent him here, and now, you know, now we're fighting, you know? But, uh, I mean, so, like, being on the two contender series, that, that doesn't really mean anything, because, you know, each fighter is different, you know? Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't train for, this fight, okay, this fight, this type of style, I just train to, like, get better, you know? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, I, I I don't really know what's going to happen in this fight, you know? I mean, I'm I'm, I'm going to come out there, bang, do what I do best, you know, p- put on a show. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm going to come out with, with my fucking hand raised, man. Yeah, I, I love that you mentioned that, you know, coach versus, you know, student – Students fighting. It's like it's like an episode of Cobra Kai going going on yeah, at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. let's talk about. So you were the champ. You were the flyweight champion. You, I believe, you had to give up your belt to be on the contender series. Is that true? Well, no, no, I or, I, I didn't have to. So, so I won the belt, uh, 2018. Yeah. Right, and then I uh, defended it again, uh, February 2019. Yeah. Right, and then. I got called to the contender series, right? Yeah. But then when but then when I got called to the contender series, right, the whole COVID thing had, had freaking happened. Yeah. So yeah. like so so there were no shows all of nineteen because I won my I, I defended my belt February twenty third of nineteen. Yeah. So then so there was no one to fight for the belt because uh this is the first show back since the last no, it's not the second show back okay. uh, in Texas. Since the last so of uh, February twenty third, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh so really there haven't been like any one fighting okay. for uh you know for like, oh, for, I, for, like I, fly rate chance, I guess. Yeah. Sorry, I, I for some reason I thought you had to give up the belt. Sometimes that happens. that happens a lot. I apologize. Um Yeah, no, that's cool. What do you, what do you think about this opponent like stylistically? You said you said he was good, but give me a little more detail. Like wh- wh- what is he's good at um, and where and where well, can you beat him? Yeah, so I I think I'm gonna beat him uh uh, maybe the third, fourth, fifth round. Okay. Uh, we'll call it. Uh, we'll call it. He's more of like, like, like Jeffrey. He's more of like a stand-up fighter, more like a Muay Thai slash kickboxing type of fighter. You know, I'm uh, I'm pretty much well-rounded. Like, I mean, I, I throw kicks if I have to. You know, um, me and Jeffrey we threw like the same amount of kicks, and you know, he's he he. I know Jeffrey was like a some kind of champion. You know, and um. Uh, and and the kickboxing, kickboxing yeah, or yeah. some shit like that, right? But uh, uh, this guy, his his style is at the same weight, is, is, is the same kind, um, except that he's a little heavier. Um, um, CJ doesn't really make weight. Like I, I mean, he fights at one twenty five, but uh, he fights at thirty five as well, and um, he doesn't usually make one twenty five. So uh, uh. My main concern is him making weight, yeah, for us to fight. Because if if you look up his his record, um, what call it? He has a bad habit of not making one twenty five. You know, yeah. So uh, so I, I I just hope he uh, makes weight so that uh, we could fight. You know, because the uh, state they won't allow us to fight once we uh, take a COVID test, and then sure. if he doesn't make weight, then we you know that's it. So they have like some really strict rules. You know. Yeah. Where, yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, he's decent, you know. I mean, he's good. His record, I think, eight and two, eight and three. You know, uh, oh God, he fought some of the guys I fought. You know, he finished the, some of the guys I finished. I finished, you know, everyone I fought, right, except for my last two fights. But uh, I mean, it's gonna be fun. You know, I'm pretty sure some of his ways are all the same, being that you know his coach was under my coach, so I'm sure you know. Some of the the like the wording they say is probably going to be the same thing, but it's going to be fun, man. It's going to be fun. 
Uh, my last question, unfortunately, we ran out of time. We actually went over time. Uh, everyone always loves this question. What, what's your prediction? Everyone wants to know, how, how do you win? You said you said late, but give me, is it a knockout? <laughs> is it a submission? Like, how do you win? Uh, I'm going to win by uh, TKO. 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 Yeah, I don't want to say submission because I have one submission on, on my uh, my freaking resume. You know, I have, I think, uh, two submissions as an amateur, you know. Uh, okay. That's that's not not really my thing. I mean, well, maybe uh, we'll get some mission by strikes. Maybe so. <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, all right, we ran yeah, out of time. So, okay. Yeah, that's cool, brother. It's cool. Yeah, I'm saying so. Um, uh, maybe uh, uh, TKO in the uh, second or third round. There you go. Second or third round TKO. Guys, we had an awesome uh, just lineup. This one. First of all, I want to thank. <laughs> The first one guest we had, we had Josh Thompson, former Strike Force champion, current Bellator color commentary. He was followed up by Casey Kenny, who's in a huge matchup against uh, former UFC Bantamweight champion. And our last guest, I want to thank him for his time. Wish him good luck. He's fighting this weekend. Jacob Silva, hope that you do very successful at that. And I hope you finally get that call that you've been waiting on. Thanks for your time. I'm waiting. waiting. I appreciate that very much, Keith. Thank you. Yeah. Guys. Hey, make, right, make make sure I got another loaded lineup next week. I can't announce it because I'm always worried if I announce it, someone will fall out. But next week's lineup is just as loaded. Stick around. You just listen to MMA past, present, and future. <laughs>